Welcome to Happy Talks with Dr. Alice and Donovan. Dr. Alice Fong is a holistic naturopathic doctor and founder of Amour de Soi Wellness. And Donovan Jensen is a software engineer and founder of HowToHappy.com. Together, they're out to cause more happiness in the world. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Happy Talks. My name is Dr. Alice, and here's my amazing co-host, Donovan. And today I have an amazing guest. Kimberly Spencer is an award-winning, high-performance, trauma-informed coach and trainer. She's also an Amazon best-selling co-author, international motivational speaker, and founder of Crown Yourself. Dot com, helping visionary leaders transform their self-limiting stories, build their empire, stand out fearlessly, and make the income and impact they deserve. Please welcome Kimberly. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Alice and Donovan. I am so excited. Do, do I need to call you Dr. Alice? Oh, I don't care either way. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, I'm pretty careful. <laughs> yes. I feel like, well, I mean, with the title of doctor, like you earn that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For whatever reason, most, most patients call me Dr. Alice because I feel like I don't actually like Dr. Fong. I feel like it's too formal. (laughs) So the Dr. Alice is like the casual, but still maintaining my title. (laughs) Yeah. So owning, like fully owning the title. And I mean, Mm -hmm. it's hard to get that. Absolutely. So tell us a little about yourself and your story and what led you to building your own empire. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, I came up with my, the idea for my business on my honeymoon Mm. and I was looking for something. I had literally just signed the buyout papers three weeks before I walked down the aisle for my e-commerce company. Mm -hmm. I was on my honeymoon in this beautiful Airbnb in Italy, wondering like, what the Mm -hmm. heck am I going to do when I get back? Mm -hmm. Um, And I had so many interests that I didn't really know how to combine them all into one thing. I'd had a fitness business. I'd had an e-commerce business. I'd been a screenwriter. And I, I loved writing. I loved performing. I loved being on shows. I loved interviews. I loved helping good causes. I'd healed a 10 year battle with bulimia. I'd healed being in uh, abusive relationships and found the love of my life. I'd been able to figure out business to a degree, but never found one that like fully fulfilled me. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in pageants and all different sorts of seemingly unrelated things. And my husband and I were brainstorming as you do on your honeymoon um, and (laughs) over way too many espressos. And I leaped off the couch and I said, crown yourself. And he's like, what's that? I said, I don't know. It's the name of my business. (laughs) (laughs) And really what crown yourself is, it's, it's a desire to have holistic success. Mm. where it's not one thing at the expense of the other. It's not your body at the expense of your business. It's not your business at the expense of your relationships or your career at the expense of your relationships. It's being able to have that holistic success and fulfillment and leading as, as the leader that you are. I think a lot of times we don't take, we don't realize how we are already leaders in our lives. Like Mm -hmm. as, as I'm a mom of a toddler, I've got one coming in like a couple weeks Mm -hmm. and I'm (laughs) like, and I'm like, I am an example Mm -hmm. for, for my children. And I'm an example for my husband and I'm an example for my clients and my students. And even just being on social media, people are watching you. People Mm -hmm. are, are seeing what you're doing and they're, they're listening to what you're saying And if you can step into that role as a leader and really, in essence, crown yourself the the leader that's coming from that place of good heart and mission and purpose, I think we would see a massive transformation in this world of of joy, of people owning their their worth, and of really claiming their power. Hmm. Yeah, I love it. I absolutely resonate with all of that because, you know, as a, as a stress doctor, um, but as someone also who finds herself constantly stressed, it's kind of the ironic thing, just establishing that work-life balance is so challenging because we want it all, but it's like, I don't want to, I want an amazingly successful business, but of course I want to not at the expense of my family and quality time of my, and for my health and my well-being. So I have to constantly like 
manage all of that um, on an ongoing basis. So I'm curious, you know, when you're working with people who tend to live big lives, how do you, how do you support them or what tools or tips do you offer them? So really what I, what I see, especially with people um, in all different areas, Mm -hmm. they are, it it starts with taking ownership of your choices. Mm -hmm. It starts with, because what happens is, is blame is super insidious. So if we start blaming our kids for taking away our time from being able to focus on our business or our career, or if we start blaming our husband for not supporting us for whatever reason, or blaming our spouse or our partner, like Mm -hmm. it starts to spiral of resentment that gets to Mm -hmm. be very insidious and that drains your happiness. It sucks the joy from you. It sucks the joy from what you're doing. And a lot of times Mm -hmm. we, as humans, we, we connect on what all the time we connect on an emotional level. And so what happens when we're in that space is then we'll connect with other people who are also in similar energies and similar emotions of resentment and that feeling. And so how do Mm. we break free from that? So the first thing is really taking ownership of your choices, Mm. owning the fact that, yeah, you chose to have kids. Like, yeah, you chose to be married to this person. Ideally, you had some good reason as to why you, you know, you chose that person as your partner or you chose to be in this business and giving yourself your power back instead of having all these have tos having, I get to, I get to show up with joy to my children. Mm. Like, I'll give you an example. Like this morning I was, I was kicked until midnight last night by this little fella inside and I was exhausted. And yet I still woke up. And when I saw my son, I was like, I am choosing to be really joyful, even though I've only had a limited amount of sleep. (laughs) I'm going to choose into having joy. I'm Mm going to choose into enjoying the pieces of my day. And I'm also going to choose into taking a nap this afternoon. Um, (laughs) But really really owning those choices and having it come from that place of, of power instead of like, being tossed around in this reactive reactionary mode that gets us into this spiral and this, this drowning in blame, which, which really can prevent us from feeling fulfilled. It can prevent us from feeling happy. So the first thing is always really owning your choices. I mean, when I first started my business, I had about a year and a half that I was really dabbling I was stuck in what I call productive procrastination. Mm -hmm. And it was because one of my primary values, the primary value of my company is ownership period. And Mm -hmm. like I talked about owning your power and claiming your power, but I wasn't personally living it for a year and a half in my business. I was stuck in a cycle of blame. I was blaming my former business partner. I was blaming myself. I was doubting myself and I was stuck in this, dungeon of doubt, I call it, and questioning and blaming others instead of really looking at the common denominator after a year and a half Mm -hmm. was me. Like I had to really take ownership of that. And then once I did, and ownership is not a fun conversation to always have. Like sometimes ownership means you got to own your stuff (laughs) (laughs) and not it's not always the most pleasant and it's not always the most sexy because it can feel very good in the moment to point the finger at someone else or point the finger at a situation or point the finger at this experience or that thing that happened to me. But when you can shift the conversation into like, how did this happen for me? How can I grow from this? Then that, then that shifts the conversation that you're having in your mind to, to allow yourself to grow into something greater. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Like having ownership, and there's a lot of research around this too, but the perception of control or having ownership is one of the main things that leads to happiness or produces happiness. On that note, however, many people I'm sure are very, very used to being really stuck in this blame mode or they'll hear something like kind of what you just said. And and maybe if you push them face to face, they'll say like, okay, I guess it's my fault, right? I'm sure you've seen some amount of yeah. uh, pushback on some of these things. So I'm curious, what is your approach when you find someone or interact with someone who is, they, they want to take ownership, but they can't quite make it there feeling wise, right? Because logically, or at least for me, I'll just speak from my own experience. 
for myself, logically, a lot of times I can say like, okay, here's my part in it. And then emotionally, I don't get on board. The yeah. emotion part is like sitting there pouting, like, uh, it was, <laughs> I'll say it's my fault, but it really wasn't. So I'd just be curious how you approach some of that stuff. Mm. Well, I personally, emotionally, because I, you know, we all kind of sometimes have those moments of pity party and acknowledging the fact that that's, that's human. Mm-hmm. Like blame is, it, it's human. It's, it's biological. <laughs> like we, it's, it's so acknowledging and giving us some grace for our own humanity. Cause I see ownership as really like a pendulum. So there's the one side of the ownership. That's the victim mindset. It's blaming everyone else, blaming other people, blaming experiences, blaming this happened to me. My dog died. My dad was an addict. This, you know, da, 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 da. All, all of those other external circumstances. Then there's the other side of the pendulum that I see really with high performers where they're so much at fault that it's everything is their fault. And they take so much ownership that it's be, it's taking other people's ownership too. And so I say to the, that group of people, I say, you can only take a hundred percent. You cannot take 10% of somebody else's ownership. Mm -hmm. So if somebody else, if a circumstance happened, there's two people in that, in that dance, it's the other person's responsibility to take ownership of their percentage of responsibility. I see this a lot with, with mm-hmm. clients who have had divorces mm-hmm. and they feel very bad about the fact that their former partner is still struggling and still dealing with things. And eventually there comes a point where you're not responsible for their life anymore. Like you're, you're not responsible for their happiness. They still have to start making their own choices. Mm-hmm. And cause really ultimately we're only responsible for ourselves. And so ownership I see is this beautiful place in the middle. That's not saying, you know, I'm that bad things don't happen and like stuff that you can be a victim of. There's a big difference between having a victim mindset and being um, a victim of circumstances, like stuff happens that is bad, that is unfathomable. And yet how can we grow from that? So looking at every experience is a space of how can I grow from this? How can this help me serve? So one of my clients, she is a single mom, has two babies and, and both from different, different partners. And she was speaking at this, uh, school and every other person who was brought into this school, um, was, to, to speak like these women were like, you don't know my life. Like all the students mm-hmm. were like that they, they had their arms crossed. They were a very lower income family from very lower income families. Some had babies, some didn't. And every person that they brought in to speak didn't resonate except for my client who, when she spoke, she's like, Hey, I'm just going to be honest. Like this was my life. This was my mistake. This was my message. She owned her past. Mm -hmm. And it actually built the rapport with the students to be able to say, oh yeah, I've, I've had a baby from, you know, a different dad than the partner that I'm with or than the person that I'm with or like, Mm -hmm. and, and so they were able, it was able to build up that rapport. So it comes from both owning your mistakes, owning Mm -hmm. your mess, owning how you feel and owning your successes. Like that's a big one too, owning the progress that you're making. Because so often, especially for my high achievers, for especially for perfectionists recovering right here, like (laughs) we so often don't give ourselves enough credit or acknowledgement for the progress that we're making. And so it's also about owning your successes, owning your achievements, owning the fact that like that, that you accomplished this or you did that and, and, and really stepping into that. And to speak to your, uh, your question around having that sort of like pity party emotionally, sometimes really it comes, it, it just comes down to that acknowledgement, um, acknowledgement and acceptance of like, okay, I, I'm accepting that this is where I'm at. I'm also accepting that this is not where I'm going to stay. Mm. That this is like, I'm, I'm going to have this pity party. I know, like, let me just have my moment of being human Mm -hmm. and let me just have that, that grace with myself and then being able to say, okay, now what, now what do I choose? Like, I logically know that I'm like, I could be blaming this person, but really I need to take ownership of my part in this conversation or my part in this experience. 
So what do, what do I get to choose now? Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's basically honing into those feelings and accepting them as part of the process. And I think the times, again, I'll speak from my own experience, though I'm sure other people have had it. The times that it has not been effective is when I'm trying to push those things away or kind of block them out or in some other way, get rid of them. Um, because I, I'm, I'm thinking, hey, I need to take ownership of this. But I'm feeling like, oh, this was such an unfair situation and I hated it and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that makes a lot of sense to me as a, a more adjusted strategy for dealing with something like that. I wanted to step into a related topic, which is um, honing in a little bit more on the word ownership. I'd be curious where you see the similarities or differences between the ownership and something like responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it depends for like every word is going to have a different experience for every single human based on their experiences and life and, and all that. So I choose the word ownership, um, responsibility. Like we do like response. If like I, if we are to get really linguistically nerdy, like you're able to produce a response. Mm-hmm. Um, like we're all able to produce a response, right? So it doesn't, for me, it doesn't really have the kapow in essence. And that's just me personally, (laughs) that ownership does like own when you own something, it's, it's yours Mm. versus like, we're able to produce a response. What response is that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So ownership for me, it has a little bit more personalization, um, and just a little bit more kapow. It's just my own personal thing though. Yeah, I kind of agree. It has, it just seems more empowering in my mind versus like responsibility. It's almost like when we were talking about this ownership and which is taking responsibility, we can't blame others for our, yeah. our issues and our unhappiness, but it's almost like responsibility is like, oh, well, it's my fault. And I know it. And that doesn't sound so fun. It's like, yeah, yeah I know it's my fun. fault. I don't like it. <laughs> Kind of a yeah. Thing. yeah, I think culturally responsibility, it also has a lot of like societal weight to it mm-hmm. um, beyond the word ownership. Like there's kind of that like, oh, I have to be responsible, like mm-hmm. being a responsible adult. <laughs> um, there's just there's just those those underlying subtext and connotations with the word responsibility. I've had a lot of clients who have struggled with that particular word Mm because it just, it just feels like such a have to right? for me. Like Mm -hmm. that's, and it, rather than I get to take ownership, I get to really step into owning this and the choice of owning this instead of like just choosing that response. Like we Mm -hmm. are able to choose our response. Sometimes we don't like the choices that we're given. But ownership, we get to own that response. We get to own like what what it is that we are choosing into. It's mm-hmm. just it just has a little bit more power for me. Definitely, yeah, I can definitely see see the difference. At least for from I would be in agreement with you um, from my perspective because kind of a summary of what I was hearing in your your description of ownership is like not placing the blame, but actually. Um, and we're playing the victim game. I think we are all guilty of playing the victim and actually like having the power to choose how our life goes. And ultimately we can take all the actions. We can do all the things. It doesn't guarantee an exact result, but when we own it, it compels us to like keep trying and persevering in the face of all the, the chaos that might be happening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it really is um, taking that, that step that it's, it's, you own your choices, you own your past, but you're not, it's not a fault thing. I think that that's a big, that's a big Mm. part of the pendulum is that so often we want to say it's my fault or it's her fault or it's their fault, or it's, you know, the economy's fault or it's, 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 and, and fault automatically just connotes blame Mm -hmm. versus, this is that what happened. I'm going to take ownership that this, these are the results that X, Y, and Z produced. Mm -hmm. And we're going to, I don't like these results. (laughs) I don't like this experience. Mm -hmm. I'm going to choose to have another one. So even, even if it is having a pity party for yourself, that's totally fine. And 
legitimate if that's something you want to choose into and like lean into and say, okay, now where did this get me? Like I totally had a pity party for myself like a week ago. It's just like, oh, my body and I, I feel this and I feel like oh, the baby's kicking my liver and just mm-hmm. having this like, oh, this moment of just like frustration and a p- full on, full on pity party. Mm-hmm. And I recognize it. I'd even told my husband, I said, I know I'm in this like emotional pity party. So I had to let the emotion, the, the wave of those feelings process instead of like judging them and trying to damn them up for one. Mm -hmm. And then once I allowed it to process, I was able to say, okay, well, where did that really get me? So Mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm not any farther ahead. I feel a little bit of like a cathartic emotional release. So I feel a little bit better now. What could I do now? What, what could I choose into? Mm -hmm. So really owning that, that, the, the, the space that we can choose mm. and the, the power to, because emotions and feelings, they're human. Like they come and they're a sign of something. Mm-hmm. And so I always think of feelings as like a package as mm-hmm. like, especially if, if you're feeling like having a pity party for yourself, which right. totally happens. <laughs> like I had one last week. Um, <clears throat> but it's like, it was like a package of emotion gets delivered within the package of like, here's the pity party package, mm-hmm. but inside is something that there, there is something that you deeply value. That's probably getting knocked around a bit. Maybe it's a boundary thing. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's, uh, one of your, your core values that's being shaken a little bit. Maybe it's a, a long time fear or, um, a desire for safety or familiarity in something. And so that package gets to be unpacked with, with the experience of the emotion. And so allowing for that human experience and then opening up the package and see what, seeing what's really inside, what's really stimulating the thing behind the thing. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I was actually just thinking, yeah, I was having a pity party for myself last week. And maybe I'm still in my, my <laughs> pity party. I was actually sharing with Donovan and I shared with some people about how I had invested a lot of money, not just like a couple hundred, it was like a few thousand dollars in a marketing venture to like promote webinars to help sell my um, online course coaching group coaching program. And it was just like a lot of time and effort. I, I was working with this ad agency. It's like all this time and money and effort And um, we got 200 people signed up and then 50 or so people showed up and zero people bought. (laughs) And I was like heartbroken and wanted to cry. And I was devastated. And I was like, why do I bother? I was just like in this, this huge pity party. And, and I knew like in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, this doesn't mean I'm going to give up or anything. Although I was like very disappointed and defeated. And I was like, ugh. <laughs> but at the same time, I still feel like I haven't gotten myself like, I know I'm not giving up, but I'm not excited. <laughs> I'm not owning that experience. It's still like feeling like a failure in my brain, even though like intellectually, <laughs> emotionally, it feels like a failure. But intellectually, I'm like, no, this is a learning lesson. Yeah, I'm going to learn something from this. I'm going to restructure my offer. And do it better the next time. But at the same time, I'm like, oh, that just totally flopped. And so I'm just like getting out of the intellectual brain and the emotional is kind of not quite synced up. If you know what I'm thinking yet. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if you have any suggestions for me because I'm in that place right now. (laughs) Oh, one of my favorite questions to ask in that space is how is this the best thing that ever happened to you? (laughs) Yeah. Ah, I don't even know. I feel like I, I keep going into like strategy mode versus like emotional. And I don't know if that's benefiting me because I'm like, okay, clearly this didn't work. Maybe I have to go back to the thing I used to do, which is just focusing instead of like, do I scrap my online course group coaching and just focus on like high ticket programs? Cause I knew that has worked in the past. Maybe I need to go back into that because that would support my business better. Um, so that's where I was going, but I guess, yeah, I guess that was a lesson in itself. How is this the best thing that's ever happened to me? And mm-hmm. even, even on a personal level, like maybe if you, without the strategy on a personal level, how is that the best thing mm-hmm. that ever happened to you to tap you into what, what is it that you value? Mm-hmm. 
from that experience, what, what can all these emotions that are kind of swirling up that, that still haven't logically, cause you can't really logic, you can't logic yeah, an emotion. Can't logic. Um, <laughs> yeah, so sure. like all of the emotions that get swirled up, what, what are those emotions showing you that you value deeply? Oh, that's good. You know, I think why it was like extra heartbreaking. Cause I've, I've like tried a lot of things. And of course, as a business owner, you're going to like blow money on things that don't yeah. work. And that's part <laughs> of the learning process. But I have blown money on things that have worked. So I get that. That is part. But I think it was like extra heartbreaking for me because this year in particular is like more like financially challenging because I'm, I'm getting married. We're trying to have a baby trying to get a house. So like, those are the things that I value. So I really wanted this to be the thing that launches my business even further. And it wasn't. So that was like the heartbreak underneath it all. Yeah. So I guess I value family (laughs) wanting to support my family. Yeah. Yeah. The, the value of family and wanting to, to create that life and also Mm -hmm. the trust, like the trusting that, yeah, this didn't work, but maybe something else is going to work out. Like mm-hmm. something else is going to work. Trusting in the decision yeah. as well. And this has been a common theme that I've seen both with myself and with um, all of all of my clients is, is learning to trust that, that the universe, God, source, whatever it is that you believe in, that whatever we're co-creating with has, has got your back. And that even if it's not in your timing, it's going to happen. Yeah. Like for, for me, like trust was my word of last year. Cause we ended up, um, uh, in Australia, my husband is a voice actor. And so he was appearing with, uh, ironically, the cast of the walking dead is at a comic-con convention as the pandemic was breaking out. Um, <laughs> I found that very humorous <laughs> and we just decided, we decided to stay. And we, my husband and I looked at each other and we made this decision and we knew that this was going to be, we just had a gut feeling in that, like, this is going to work. Like this is, and we didn't know how we didn't know the exact formula or the exact strategy. Um, but we just trusted into that intuition that, Mm -hmm. that it was going to work out and have there been challenges? Yeah. Like I was, my, my dad passed away in January and I wasn't able to go home for his funeral or be with him in that space. But then again, my, neither was my mom because of the COVID restrictions with the hospital. So I had to look at how is still this choice. Like every time I would circle back to the choice of, of the trust in the vision of what I'm creating Mm. and saying, is this still what I'm building? Is this still in alignment with what I want? Yes, it is Mm -hmm. because we've always wanted to raise our kids traveling the world and experiencing different cultures and, and being able to live in different countries. And, and so this has been uh, still a blessing. So even with that, I'm still quite, even with that feat, that setback that, and that brought a lot of emotions, Mm -hmm. um, there still was leaning into that trust and are you trusting in the vision is going to work out regardless of what form or strategy it's going to work out in. So Mm. if that's not the form, if that's not the way that it's going to work, how else could it work? How, like, how else could you hit those income goals that you wanted to hit? How else could you, um, could more clients come to you? How else could you find other, uh, people to join this group coaching program, like Mm -hmm. constantly allowing for yourself to, to trust in, in the vision and in the possibility that sometimes is not consciously seen. Like Mm -hmm. sometimes we have our little conscious awareness. I like to think of it as like, we have the unconscious mind and everything that goes on there. And then we have our little conscious awareness box that we think is there's a book. (laughs) <laughs> that we think is, is the form that is the, there's a bug in my box that is the form in which it's going to work. And so we try to structure this form, but maybe it's like the Wright brothers. And I only know that because my son, my toddler loves the book about the Wright brothers. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe that form of that version of that plane doesn't take off. Mm -hmm. but you keep on trusting in the vision that yes, I I will be able to fly. Yes, I will be able to fly. Yes, I will be able to fly. And so you keep tweaking that plane to figure out what is the structure in order to allow for that vehicle to take off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That could, I have to wrap my brain around that. (laughs) Donovan, you have some thoughts. Go ahead. (laughs) Oh, well, 
<laughs> somehow, somehow a lot of these conversations answered questions that I haven't asked or was going to, but I was going to uh, try to step more into the space of going through an example, which we did deeply with both of you. Um, so I think that part is pretty much buttoned up. But as far as um, this idea of ownership, I really resonated with the piece that you said uh, of going back to when you made the decision to stay um, and really noting that as the place where you had agency and decided you were going to stay there. And then whatever consequences came as a part of it were part of the package of that choice. And I think that really helped me get a better vision of how you can apply ownership to certain certain aspects, right? So if we go to Dr. Alice's story, there's a piece where there's kind of this outcome, right? And there's an ownership piece before that, where at some point she had the choice to invest in that route and mm-hmm. start walking on that path. And th- this is regardless of whatever adjustments or whatever's going to work, but there's that clear piece which is the piece of ownership in that story, or at least in my mind, that's that's the clear piece. Um, so I, I feel like it's really through the discussion uh, flushed out exactly uh, one of the more practical ways that you can kind of start grasping at some of these ownership ideas by looking at the points where, okay, maybe you know that specific outcome, maybe these people came and no one bought. That's not necessarily something that you can own. Every individual made a choice whether or not to buy or not buy. But there was, you know, that earlier piece of uh, you decided to set out on that journey. And I felt a little bit weird talking about you instead of talking about myself. But that piece is a very clear like point of ownership and something that going back to uh, where you're talking about with like your vision and stuff, you can make the choices within that larger context to get to where you want to be. So to me, I don't really have another follow up question, but that that kind of tied together a lot of the themes you were talking about and made it concrete for me. Yeah, for me, it it really is coming back to that vision piece and checking in of like, what was the intention of launching the program or what was the intention of this and then sticking true to that vision? I mean, same like with with my story with staying in Australia, the intention was to provide a really diverse education of experience to my kids Mm -hmm. and through being able to travel and live in different countries. And that's always been the vision. And so even with, like, I could have chosen, had I had I really desired to, I could have chosen to go home. I could have chosen to be with my mom through this time of grief. And I could have chosen to go fly home when I heard my dad got sick and go help medicate him and take my family. And I, that would be a choice that I would also have to own. But every time I came back to the space of the vision of like, what really is the, the vision that we're creating here, that, that making that choice wasn't in alignment. Mm -hmm. And every time I came back to that choice of like, well, maybe I should go back to doing this thing, or maybe I could go back Mm -hmm. into this thing. Every time I circle back to like, well, what is the vision? Mm -hmm. If it's not in alignment with that vision, then I I go back to the owning the fact that the vision is, is happening. Mm -hmm. And so same with, you know, launching a group coaching program or, you know, shifting into private coaching or something, um, Mm -hmm. or should you go back to that? It's like, what is the vision that you had for why you started this in the first place? And then allowing that to guide, because for me, when I circle back to the vision and constantly check back in, like I own, I own the choices that I made. Yeah. And sometimes things are going to come along that are going to be the challenges that are going to question that choice. And that are going to like, are you sure you really want this one? Like, are you sure? Right. Like, and, and, and yet when we circle back to that vision, if we really own that vision of what it is of the, of the giant, why mm-hmm. that we started with leaning into that and trusting that that's going to come regardless of what form or what plane we build to get us there. Mm-hmm. Actually, that actually helps me own my, (laughs) own my decision because like I've been in this, like, oh my God, I just blew some more money on the thing that didn't work, even though I get that it was like the first shot. So, you know, I know there's testing and readjusting, um, but you know, the whole, the whole vision was to, you know, cause I mentioned I'm planning to get pregnant and all of that, build a family. Um, the goal was to not work so much in my business, to have a source of like income, like 
they say online courses are passive income, but they are not passive. It's like a shitload of work. It takes <laughs> a lot of work. <laughs> a lot I of know. Work. <laughs> so much work. Um, and it doesn't always like pay off right away. Right now it's not paying off quite quite right away. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like the vision was to be able to support my family without having to to like be so tied down working one on one with people, which is you know what what my built business is mainly. And uh yeah, I get it's going to be a struggle and I, I shouldn't give up, but I think like, yeah, coming back to the vision of, yeah, the whole purpose was to be able to make more and work less um, by working super hard right now. And I get that it's still a, a learning curve, um, but yeah, actually that I think helps me feel better about the choice that I made um, and owning the choice that I made because it was to serve that higher vision. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I, and I mean, I've made some choices in my business with lots of money (laughs) that was lost (laughs) (laughs) to the tune of five figure investments where I'm Mm -hmm. like, it it took me a while to own that choice. Cause at the time, especially in the beginning stages, I was financially strapped and in debt. And when I was, when I look back on that choice, I'm like, well, what did that, what did making that choice give me? What did allowing my, what did going through that process? Well, that process taught me that experience of investing $20,000 in a program that didn't really serve, um, to the level that I wanted it or expected it to, um, that, that experience, it taught me, well, that wasn't an, it, it wasn't, a. Mm -hmm. uh, an aligned choice. Like I remember making that choice. I remember the feeling in my body when I was making that choice that it felt like I, something I should do, but it didn't feel fully aligned to make that choice. And I couldn't describe it in words because it, it made logical sense to, to work with these mentors. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, my gut was saying, no, you don't need this. Like, no, you don't have to do this. Mm -hmm. And that experience really taught me a beautiful $20,000 lesson to (laughs) trust my intuition and my gut for when it says, this is, this is the aligned next step. This is, and trusting that if it's not this, if it's not in this form, then it's going to be in something better. Mm -hmm. And it's in that also came down to like our, even just our decision to come to Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, I had stuck to, I was supposed to run the LA marathon and I was like all gung ho about getting back into my like marathon shape because doing, uh, doing marathons really just spurs me on physically. It it gets me very feeling very aligned. Mm -hmm. And when I checked in with that form, uh, like when my husband asked me, he said, well, I've been invited to go to this convention, like, but I don't want to mess with your marathon. Like if your marathon is, is such a high priority, then like, that's where you already committed to that. We'll Mm -hmm. stay. And I checked in with my gut and I said, actually, you know, I'm okay with losing this couple hundred bucks that mm-hmm. I spent on registration. And like, I'm okay with, like, I feel it's more aligned to go to Australia. So checking into that intuition and into that feeling and mm-hmm. then owning the choice. Like I own the choice that I dropped a couple hundred bucks on a, on the marathon that I didn't run, but mm-hmm. I don't know if the LA marathon even happened last year <laughs> in March. That was um, yeah. But the ability to, to own that choice and to say, yeah, I, I, I allowed myself to surrender the form mm-hmm. of what I thought would motivate me for a form that quantum leaped <laughs> me last year. Mm-hmm. And that allowed us to quantum leap into, into our dream. It allowed me to double my business last year. It allowed me to double our profit twice last year. Like th- that's the beauty of like, when you combine ownership with intuition, Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I, I do feel like in my gut, that decision, I like compared five or six agencies and I'm usually very like, you know, I'm, I'm not quick to, to make a leap. I got to value. I yeah. got to think I got to compare. Um, and there's only been like a few instances where I've like, I, you know, first call I'm like, yeah, let's do this. Usually I'm like, let me take a step back. Let me think about it. Let me compare process. But yep. this one is one of those decisions. Cause I had made a, a great business decision, you know, a couple of years ago, first call, I was like, 
I just felt like in my gut, it was going to be the right choice. And it absolutely was. I made my investment back within two months. I made like three times back within six months. <laughs> so it was like a good investment, but this one, I mean, yeah, it's still pretty early on. We haven't tested it out, but it was one of those things where it's very rare for me to just jump on a first call, but I did because it just seemed like what I needed. Um, <clears throat> and it, it didn't work out, but I guess that kind of makes me, I feel like mixed. I'm like, should I trust my gut? <laughs> Partly because it didn't work out so well, but at the same time, it makes me feel that like, yeah, I was in alignment with my vision at, at the very least. Um, so it makes me feel not so so bad about the decision, I guess now. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes when we make decisions that we feel like are aligned and then that cause us to question, like, should we trust our gut? Should we trust our intuition? Sometimes looking at the reasons around like mm -hmm. why, because sometimes there can also be the logical reasons of like, well, this should make sense. Mm -hmm. And we kind of like reason or logic ourselves into it of like, well, this feels like it's in alignment with our, the, the vision. And there's also these potential shoulds of like, yeah, this should be the next step. Mm -hmm. So we can look at those shoulds of like, what, what were the shoulds that we thought were going to work? Mm -hmm. Cause we all know what happens when we should ourselves. Um, so looking at those shoulds that maybe those, those external expectations of what were those mm -hmm expectations that maybe we're coming from a place of lack or scarcity or fear and mm -hmm. then allowing ourselves and, and then examining that as well as looking at okay how how did this also combine with me trusting in the vision trusting in my gut and and what was the dance that I was doing in that moment because there's all these different pieces that come into play with really owning the choices that are moving us forward mm -hmm. Well, Kimberly, it's been such an honor. It actually has been very useful for, for me on a personal level. So I appreciate that. Um, but we are kind of out of time. Is there anything you'd like to, to plug before we wrap up today? Yeah. If you love this conversation, definitely come on over to crownyourself.com. And um, if you want, if you're like, want, if you want to learn more, then click on the button that says work with me. And you can also check out our podcast at uh, the princess and the bee on all places on all your favorite podcast places. And if you love information like this, then definitely also check out our YouTube at uh, crown yourself as well. Awesome. Awesome. All those links will be in the description below. So check it out. I know I will. And thank you so much, Kimberly, for being on our show. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Alice. And, and thank you so much, Donovan, for having me and Thank you to this bug that is just <laughs> <laughs> delightfully <laughs> wanting to be a part of our conversation. Oh. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoy this video, be sure to like it and then go and subscribe to my channel and ring the bell so you get notified when the next video comes out. If you check out in the description below, go to my website where you can get my free fast and easy guide to stress relief. Thanks again for checking us out and we'll see you next time.